Firstly, um, I'd, I'd like everyone to imagine that you're, you're at Harvard and we've got a strategy session and we're thinking about where we might locate A.W. Fraser Limited and Hautapu Pine Products. Um, I can assure you we would not pick Christchurch, New Zealand for A.W. Fraser and Hautapu Pine Products would not have started out in Taihapi either. So why? Why? So I, I believe I, I bring you an, or bring you a story of passion in business. That's what has made these two places work. Um, yeah, we must have got some strategic things right, but the main driver has been passionate and various people in these organisations really, really enjoying what they do. So as introduced, my name's Philip Benson. I am Operations Manager at AW Fraser, also Director and Shareholder there. So what we do, it's pretty damn spectacular. We literally start with rubbish, albeit very expensive rubbish, and we turn it into um, parts that we sell to Caterpillar, Mercury Marine, Komatsu, and other companies all over the world. So recently, we awarded ourselves the title of New Zealand's most advanced recycler, and so far we haven't been knocked off. Okay. Today, I've got a lot of slides and a lot of photos. Can I have a 10 minute call please? Because I, I suspect I might have some trouble. Um, so really just a look through our factory and what we do, because that's, that's who I am. I like making stuff, so you, you get to experience what I like, I guess. Also, I'll talk about our markets and sales. Um, and then John did ask me to attempt a bit of a compare and contrast um, of, of the different industries and perhaps some insight into that. So at the end I, I have that. I'm not sure about insights, probably more like personal rambling. Um, so firstly, very briefly, bronze. Yeah, we do a little bit of brass as was mentioned a minute ago. We're famous for bronze. It is not just copper and tin. There are all those alloying elements there that we use. Okay. Why is bronze used? It's for these engineering reasons. Generally, it's a very small part of a very large piece of machinery. Okay. So we make predominantly continuous cast bronze. So long lengths come out of a casting machine, which freeze as they come out chopped into length. Um, it's more likely that a factory such as ours is doing larger scale production, whereas sand, which is what everyone would be familiar with, sand is about smaller scale production, usually. So we have a foundry, we also have a brass extrusion mill, and we have a CNC machine shop. Um, tonnages, I found it very strange showing up at Fraser's 10 years ago when people talked in revered tones of a machine producing 400 kilos an hour. Um, it's big tonnages for, for a copper metals industry, obviously pathetic for a wood processor. Scale of the place, this, this year will nudge 80 million turnover. We sell all over the world, 35 countries. 200 people and we run a genuine 24-7. History of the company, we could spend 20 minutes here. It was started by Mr. Fraser in 1939. He had two sons, pretty remarkable guys and in terms of passion, one of them was more an engineer, one of them was more a sales guy. Um, the engineer travelled to Europe, saw um, cast iron being continuously cast. It had already been done with bronze elsewhere in the world, but he was the first guy to do it in the southern hemisphere. The marketing guy, pretty damn amazing. During, during the 1980s, he travelled through the Middle East, um, selling to literally into Saudi Arabia. You know, imagine organising a trip, A, without Google Maps, and B, he had to line the appointments up 
with letters, not email. It took him a year to line up a trip. Just absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, briefly through each of our departments, so we melt a 9,000 ton a year of copper and various alloying elements. Um, and I've jumped off it already, but literally 99% of what we use as a raw material is a recycled metal. So in terms of where we sit in the world, see we are very focused around bronze. That is our claim to fame. And in, from a point of view of scale, we sit in the top 10 companies in the world of integrated bronze and machine shop. Um, facilities, indicated bronze foundries and machine shops. So that, that is one of the things that has helped us succeed is that vertical integration. And it takes a long time to accumulate one's competitive advantage when you're manufacturing. Some things you can just go out and buy a machine that's instantly going to do it for you. That's not the case for us. I don't believe it's the case in many businesses really. It takes a long time to get good at what you do. A long, long time. And, and that, that's great. More recently, um, over the last 10, 15 years, one of our key competitive advantages has been sourcing the different, not, not copper, scrap copper we get enough out of New Zealand easily. We use 30-40% of New Zealand scrap copper. It's the other minor elements. We need to source them as scrap metal in order to be competitive and they literally come from all over the world. Last week our purchasing guy Matt was in Bangladesh at the ship breaking yards in Bangladesh. And yeah, it, it is like you'd imagine it to be. <laughs> So a few photos in lieu of a, a trip through the factory. What you're looking at there is a bronze continuous casting machine. It's being filled up with molten metal. Um, that's what it looks like when it's brand new. I can assure you it don't look like that now. Um, centrifugal casting. Think a front loading washing machine. Pour molten metal in the front into a steel die and cold water on the die, solidify the casting. It's a machined part there rather than, rather than a casting. Brass extrusion, we're, we're globally competitive as a continuous cast bronze manufacturer, certainly not with brass extrusions. We've got a Tonka toy for a press, and we push 40 kg at a time. Our major competitor, nearest big one is in Korea, you know, they'll push a ton at a time. So brass for us is a real niche thing. We're not a global player. There's extrusion. Machine shop. Um, yeah, I guess it's the part I struggled the most to adapt to when I changed industries. I was completely at home in the foundry within a few hours. Heavy industry is, is what I've known and loved found the precious nature of the people working in the machine shop tough. Um, I've come to enjoy it more now. It's, it's the part of our factory that looks nice and it's really flash, lots of good machines, but our, our true competitive advantage is having that foundry and having it integrated with this. You can go out and buy CNC lathe easily, going out and buying bronze continuous casting machine, much, much harder and operating it even harder still. So we have 30 lathes. So onto markets. So geographically, it's our spread. USA, definitely the biggest. Um, the way we sell, I found it interesting when I first showed up. It's mostly done through sales agents living um, living in the particular country. The USA, we have two guys there who they more or less only sell products we make. Um, that's worked well for us in the past. Going forward, is it the right way? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, 
I get, what horrified me initially was just how expensive it is using these guys. Now, they take, thank you, they take a five percent cut, um, which when you've got a product you're selling where raw material is fifty percent of the value, that's like ten percent to me. Ten percent. Um, rough split, it doesn't matter. So rattle through various um, market sectors. So rail, um, I'll pick one product out of here. We make a slack adjuster nut that goes into braking systems in rail wagons. We estimate we have one of our nuts in 40 to 50% of the rail wagons in the United States. Marine, Mercury, Yamaha, and a bunch of other more industrial names. Mercury, we have a part in every outboard engine in the world, over 90 horsepower. Gearboxes, we have SEW in Germany. Um, amazing business to be associated with. Massive volumes. Um, we supply, as you can see, a bronze gear there that goes into a worm gearbox. Last year, 280 tonnes of those parts. Um, Caterpillar, that was what excited me when I first showed up. I grew up in that world and I just could not believe that this place in Christchurch made parts for Caterpillar Everyone always says, oh, yeah, you, you sell stuff to Goffs. No, absolutely not. We sell to Caterpillar in the United States. They put it in a little yellow box, send it back to Christchurch, probably via Singapore, and you will pay approximately 100 times what we receive for selling them the part. <laughs> I might exaggerate slightly, but 10 or 20 times anyway. Um, hydraulics, lots of hydraulic parts, usually in variable displacement pumps. More recently, oil and gas. Um, parts into what I tell my wife are mud pumps. Another name for a mud pump is a fracking pump. Water. Um, we did have a big market in Saudi Arabia. Last couple of years that hasn't been happening. Saudi's not spending so much money on agriculture anymore. And there's a list of brands. Pretty, pretty exciting places to sell to and amazing factories to visit. Absolutely amazing. I've had the good fortune of going through Caterpillar's uh, large tractor factory in Peoria, the home of Cat, and felt the felt the building shake as they drove a D11 off the end of the line. It's pretty cool. Um, so transition, as I said, to, to my ramblings and just a, a slide for an interlude. That's me nearest the front wheel there. It's, I don't know, it's 18, 20 years ago. Um, I didn't have any hair then either, but I most certainly was about 20 kg lighter. Um, for those of you from a, from a forestry background, that's in Karyoe and behind the, what was then the Winstones pulp mill, and that's among the last minor species to come out of there, so it was um, Corsican pine or nigra as we called it. Um, woods versus metals, um, you know, mostly it's, it's the same, You're starting with a raw material that's expensive and transforming it. There's, there's some understandable differences. I've already mentioned the difference in pace where three or four hundred kilos an hour is considered fast. There's certainly a lot of science. It's not just about freezing it. We have to manipulate the mechanical properties in all sorts of ways. I guess the main difference that I noticed when I showed up was the amount of capital required to run AW Fraser. It's just mind-blowing. Um, the equipment is expensive, but the stock is even more expensive. Because we're sourcing from around the world, we often pay for it up front, so it's sitting on the water for six or eight weeks. 
that will be on our site for a couple of months and then if you're supplying someone like Caterpillar, I can assure you you don't get paid up front. Um, so financing AW Fraser is a very big deal. Um, four or five years ago, Paul, our CFO, we, we had to do something or we were going to go down because the price of copper jumped hugely. It's more than four or five actually, thinking about it. So we had a a very nice scenario, very simple scenario, which is always the best ones. We already had our debtors insured. Our order book is always covered from an FX point of view. So we thought, Eureka, that gives us the ability to borrow offshore without any risk at much lower rates. So that's what we've done, and we do it with sort of a revolving trade finance. Without that, I don't think I'd be standing here today. Um, Advancing technology, um, I, I see it as a continued evolution rather than a revolution. I mean, Dieter's here somewhere, I've seen him. I completely agree with Dieter that something like Industry 4.0 is a great handle or name to apply. Um, it really, it's just, it's just continuation of what's been happening for the last 100 years. The handle of 4.0, that's good from a political point of view or, or ex exciting people that come through your business. It's one thing that's been in my mind a lot um, and I've heard it talked about a lot from other people is just manufacturing business is just becoming so much more capital intensive. Starting out like my dad and I did with a Huff 30 and a Moorbark post peeler and the harvesting crew consisted of a, you know, an old dungaree cat 518 and a half 60 and our success revolved around leading people and getting people to work well with, with the old gear. You know that to start a crew, a harvesting crew like that or, or a wood processing business now, really tough, really tough. So business has become much more capital intensive Maybe not a pulp and paper mill, you know, they've always been pretty expensive. Um, so I look at, at my attitude to capital at, at 51 years of age and the sort of risks I'm prepared to take with it. And I always wonder whether I'm too conservative and New Zealanders are too conservative. It's sort of returns we get out of manufacturing, you know, you wonder why you bother. Why not, why not just give your money to the ANZ to look after? Um, so, yeah, that's why there's a question mark there. I'm, I'm worried that I'm too conservative with capital. So, as I've said, startup manufacturing, much more challenging. And it gives rise, I guess, in my mind, to a, to a different success factor rather than being great at leading a team of guys and getting them out of bed in the morning and making sure they're eating food properly. Now, it's much more about optimising the use of capital. Um, and you need people who can combine both technical and commercial ability to do that. And preferably you need it in one brain, so the one person does both. Otherwise you've got to bring, bring them together. Um, so to, to loop, try and loop right around to the, to the theme, um, why manufacturing matters is, well, I, I think it's simple, it's, strong belief of mine that you've got to have economic diversification both vertically within a supply chain and horizontally across as many sectors as possible. And why? It's because the relative values of the different sectors and the value chain positions, they change over time. Um, they do. It might be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but when a, a manufacturing or any business and it takes so long to grow your competitive advantage, you've got to have seeds in place in as many places as possible. Otherwise, when things change, you can't adapt. Um, and as I said earlier, location wasn't a barrier for, for Fraser's or Hautapu. Um, I think it's important to, yeah, lobby, lobby people, lobby politicians, to try and get a fairer trade environment. Um, I think you've got to be careful not to bog down on that. Um, and once you've decided you're in what you're doing, then just get on with it and, and try really hard.
Okay.